Well, let me invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians. I want to alert you to the reason why I do something on a regular basis um, so that it doesn't go un, unnoticed or uh, missed in some way. Uh, typically, you may notice that the first thing that I say when we are coming to the message is uh, to open your Bibles to a particular place in Scripture. Um, the reason that I do that is to call our attention to what is about to take place, that we are about to look into God's Word. Uh, someone could make a case that it's not the best way to open a public speaking moment. It'd be better if I came walking over here and I began to tell you some story or illustration. I typically save that for later in the message uh, to make a, a very important theological point. What, what we are doing right now is not listening to a public speaker. We are studying God's Word. We are listening to the very voice of our Maker Comfort, encourage, remind, rebuke, strengthen, and speak to us. That's what we're doing whenever we read God's Word. It is a trembling joy. We're going to begin reading in verse 5 of chapter 2 in the book of Philippians, although our focus this morning is going to be verses 9 through 11. But just for context, I want to back up a little bit in the passage and read a bit more of it, but we're going to focus on 9 through 11. Let's begin reading Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now our passage this morning. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention is a remarkable phrase in our culture. It is remarkable. It is conditioned on us that when that phrase begins, you know how it's going to end, and your head snaps back, and you sit a little straighter, and you focus. We've been trained in countless public moments that, ladies and gentlemen, is about to be followed by, may I have your attention, and we are supposed to focus. Something is supposed to capture our attention for a few minutes. We're supposed to zero in. We're supposed to stop our distractions. We're supposed to concentrate and listen closely. And sometimes, I think we need a, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention in our everyday life. We need it actually to be something we can say to our own souls. We need it as a, a voice that calls us to attention in the mundane moments of making breakfast and caring for children and answering that work email and deciding what to do on our Friday night and thinking about our budget. We need a, may I have your attention kind of voice that causes our soul to sit up and take notice and pay attention and stop wandering or browsing or being distracted. We need the, may I have your attention kind of voice. Well, well that is this passage. This passage is God saying to us, may I have your attention. Direct your attention, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, children of the living God. Direct your attention, and he wants to direct your attention to a particular location. I think the passage essentially is an attention-grabbing, attention-focusing call from the Lord to focus on the exaltation of Jesus Christ. 
May I have your attention, we might paraphrase, the exaltation of Jesus Christ. That's what God the Father is doing in this passage. He's been talking about the calling of humility that is present in the church and the ultimate (laughs) display of the humility of God himself in the person of his son culminating in his death on the cross has been Paul's discussion for the last few verses as both a theological celebration of who our God is and a continued motivation to have this same mind among yourselves. But before he concludes this discussion of the humiliation of Christ, he wants to talk about the end or the result of that humility in his exaltation. That's why, therefore, is the beginning of verse 9. This is the conclusion, the end, the result of the humility that Christ displayed on the cross. There is an exaltation that Paul wants to discuss, and he wants to direct our attention there. God wants to direct our attention there. God wants to get in our mind in those mundane moments and say, listen, pay attention. Pay attention. Direct your attention to the exaltation of Jesus Christ. This is the event in history that deserves your attention. This is the event you should be looking towards. This is the event that should capture your gaze, direct your attention to the exaltation of Jesus Christ. This section at the end of this hymn celebrating the humility of Jesus can be broken into two sections, the supremacy of Christ and then the submission to Christ. The supremacy of Christ and the submission to Christ, it is all about the exaltation of this humble God-man who gave his life to ransom sinners. That's, that's the focus and the gaze of this entire uh, couple of verses. Let's first look at the supremacy of Christ, beginning in verse 9. We want to notice, first of all, that there is a change in who is doing the acting, beginning in verse 9. In the previous verses, God and Paul have been describing the mentality of Jesus, God the Son, how he didn't consider his deity as something to be used to his own advantage, to be grasped, but he humbled himself. He's the actor in these first couple of verses. He's acting. He's humbling himself. He's taking on the form of a servant. He's being obedient to the cross. But in verse 9, the actor changes. In response to the humility of God the Son, God the Father begins to act. Notice the change in subject. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. And then it'll circle around in verse 11 that this is to the glory of God the Father. This is, this is God in his triune nature, but in particular, God the Father who seems to be in view here. God will now take up the mantle of activity. God is the actor. We also want to notice why he is acting. Notice that word, therefore. Therefore always points backwards. In light of what we just read, Something is about to happen. In light of what we have just studied, there is a response that is about to take place. The logic of the passage is this. God the Son did not count his deity and his rights as deity as something to be used for his own advantage. So much so that he emptied himself of the rights he had to exist exclusively in his divine nature. He took on a human nature without ceasing to be God, and he was obedient to the mission of salvation, even to the point of the ultimate scandal and humiliation, death on a cross. There could not be a greater space traveled than the one who is in very nature God himself taking on the form of manhood and then being crucified for sinners under the curse of God on the cross. The distance traveled by the beginning of this passage to the end of verse 8 is beyond any distance ever traveled in the history of creation. The one who is in very nature God was crucified on the cross. Therefore. 
The therefore is responding. It's responding to that mindset. That mindset by which Jesus reveals that the nature of the God who is God is giving. It is humble. The nature of the God who is God is self outpouring. It is not grasping. It is not looking for its own advantage. It is not indifferent to the plights even of his enemies. And Jesus has displayed that nature perfectly by going even to the cross. Therefore, therefore, God, Therefore, God, in light of Jesus' humility, in light of Jesus' personal sacrifice, in light of Jesus lowering himself beyond even the humility of manhood, even to manhood on a cross, even to death, God now has something he will do. In light of his Willing, sacrificial humiliation in light of his atoning death, in light of his willingness to die in place of sinners, in light of his willingness to reveal the sacrificial love that is at the essence of God's nature and character, in light of his willingness to do that, God will now take action. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. The word there in the Greek, it speaks of being exalted to the place above which there is no other place. It's being exalted as highly as you can be exalted. Exalted as as highly as you can. This is the superlative of exaltation. There is no higher place for Jesus to be exalted than the exaltation that he has received. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. We want to feel the logic of the passage. Obviously, Jesus was exalted in his divine nature prior to his incarnation. But this is not concerning itself merely with Jesus' deity and his right of worship in heaven. This passage is speaking to God's response to his humility. Of course Jesus deserved the worship of angels in all eternity. But the very nature of the Godhead is self-giving from one to another and from themselves to their people and their creation. And so pleased was God with the perfect image-bearing of God the Son in his humility that he responds by exalting that God-man to his rightful role as regent over all of this creation. So delighted, so honored is this humility of God the Son that God the Son will be exalted to the ultimate place of exaltation. That's the logic of the passage. The supremacy of Jesus Christ. Now let's zero in on this phrase, the name that is above every name. Obviously, Jesus did not receive the name Jesus After his crucifixion, he was already called Jesus when he was on earth. The best commentators consider it very important to connect this name idea with the name theology of the Old Testament, which Paul's a Jew, he's writing as a Jewish man who understands the Old Testament, and they think it's very likely that the name that is being referred to here is the name Lord. The name that Jesus is given above every name is the name Lord, Yahweh. This is, this is Paul's way of poetically saying, Jesus is Lord. He is the co-equal with God the Father. This is not endowing the vocabulary of Jesus with magical power so much as it is acknowledging Jesus is the rightful possessor of the name of God himself. Jesus is the the rightful claimant to the name Yahweh. The name that no person could dare speak, let alone claim for themselves. No human being could dare approach to speak, let alone claim that name, has been declared right of Jesus. The name that belongs to one belongs to Jesus. The name 
that is more glorious because it contains within it the representation of absolute power, dominion, and authority belongs to Jesus. Jesus is the rightful possessor. The the Father in the mystery of the Trinity bestows on his Son the rightful claim to Yahweh. And this is very significant because Jesus is no longer only divine. He is divine and human. So this divine human has been given the name that is above every name. Adam was not given that name. David was not given that name. No human being has ever been given that name except Jesus. He is the man who is Yahweh. That's what Paul's saying. He's been given the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, not just the name Jesus, the name that Jesus possesses, the name that Jesus has been given entitlement to, every tongue must confess what? Jesus Christ, not just that that's his name, Jesus, as an identifier, that he is what? Lord. The Greek word Lord translated the Old Testament word Yahweh. This is a Greek way of saying Jesus is Yahweh, Jesus is the God who has been worshipped as God from Adam to Abraham to Moses to David. This is that God. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, so that he might have the preeminence. This is Paul in Philippians declaring, this is God. In the mystery of the Trinity, he is not all that the Trinity is, and that he is not the Father, he is not the Spirit, but he is equally God. This is the God-man, God the Son, Jesus, Yahweh. Here he is. The name above every name has been given to the one who was crucified on that Roman cross. The crucified one is Yahweh. The one who gave himself to death is Yahweh. And in this passage, the emphasis on why he is given that name is precisely because of his humility. See see the, the incredible connection Paul is making here. It is because of his humility that he is given that name. It is because of his self-emptying that he has given that name. It is because he died on the cross that he is called Yahweh. Here's the theological point. The cross and all the humility that led up to it, it reveals Jesus to rightfully be called God. The humiliation of Jesus was that thing that prompted God the Father to declare before heaven and earth, this is Yahweh. The cross was not an aberration in the nature of God. It was the evidence of Jesus' rightful claim to this name. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. You can't be called God unless you are God. And in this passage, What reveals Jesus to be the Lord is his humility. The supremacy of Jesus Christ. I remember one time when my family and I were were visiting Boston, and there's a ship in Boston that is one of these old wooden ships that is actually still commissioned. It's the longest, I think, actively commissioned vessel. They've restored it, and it's quite impressive, actually. Wooden, wooden boat. It's been around for hundreds of years now. And while we were, we were visiting the vessel, active military personnel were on this vessel because it's an active duty vessel. It doesn't go anywhere, uh, I don't think, but it's, it's, it's there. It's active duty, and they have active duty military there. Well, while we were there, the coolest thing happened. Some guy, and I don't know what his rank was, but he must have been something impressive because he casually is dressed in civilian clothes. He casually walks up the plank and comes on board. Well, somebody knew who he was because when he (laughs) reached the top of that plank, those sailors immediately announced, they snapped into this 
position of honor. They declared, and I don't remember what his rank was or whatever, but it was some declaration. He is coming on board. And, and there's this person that you, you, you wouldn't have been able to tell any difference about him, but clearly this, this guy commanded the respect of everyone on that, but when he comes on board, everyone pays attention. What this is saying is that Jesus Christ has that position for all of creation. When he comes on board, he outranks everybody. Every single person. There is no person. There is no person who is outranking Jesus in all of creation. He outranks Everybody, he is supreme. That's the point of saying this. Jesus, the man, the carpenter Jesus, who died on the cross, who is also God, that person outranks everybody. He is the absolute supreme commander of everyone. Without any exceptions, this is Jesus. This is what this means. He is the name above everything every name. And then there is a result. He wants to spell out the implications of that. He doesn't want that just to linger as this this vague theological idea. Paul wants to explain what that means, and so he moves to his second point here. You notice the so that in verse 10. It's just Paul saying, okay, what does that mean? What does that mean, Paul, that he's the name of every, every name? So that, he says. So that, and this gets to the submission to Christ. Point number two, the submission to Christ. Here's what he's saying. So that, he has the name of of every name so that the result will be, the outcome of that will be, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. Probably that refers to celestial beings like angels and demons. That refers to people who are living on earth. And that refers to the place of the dead, the dead people who are not currently alive. It's comprehensive. At the name of Jesus, this divine name, every knee should bow. Wherever you are, if you are created, you must bow. To bow is a symbol, we can imagine, of submission, of allegiance, of acknowledgement, surrender, we might use that word. It's a surrendering to him. Every knee must bow. Without exception, every knee in all of creation, heaven, spiritual beings, earth, living humans, under the earth, the dead, they must bow at this Lord who is called Jesus. And every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Submission to Jesus is absolute, without exception. Now this introduces a couple of questions we might have in our minds. First of all, why isn't this happening now? Because obviously right now, not every knee is bowing and not every tongue is confessing Jesus Christ. Well, this, this passage speaks into what's been called the already not yet dilemma of the New Testament, where Jesus is currently exalted, but not all people are seen to be under his rule. So Paul will speak about both. He is right now exalted, but his exaltation is not acknowledged fully in the way that it will be. It is already not yet. Some things are currently true, and some things we are looking forward to. Some things are true right now, but some things we still wait for. And all the New Testament uses this kind of language. You are justified in Christ right now, but you will be glorified when he returns. You are currently a son or daughter of God right now, but you will be seen in all of your glory as that son and daughter when he returns. There's this already not yet tension throughout the pages of the New Testament. We're not waiting for everything, but we are waiting for a lot. This is speaking to that truth. What is stated here is the fact, as if it has already been accomplished, that to the name of Jesus, every knee bows. Every knee bows. It is not stating that every knee bows currently, but that ultimately and definitely and without exception, every knee bows. Every knee bows to Jesus without exception, and every tongue confesses to Jesus. It's not claiming that that's currently happening, only that it definitely will happen. It's looking at the future as if it's already taken place. It's saying, I am declaring that every knee bows to him and every tongue confesses that he is Lord. 
So we are waiting because, as Peter reminds us, God desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so he is patiently waiting for those that he will call to himself, that he will claim so that in joyful submission they may say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, that's why it isn't happening now. Let's answer a second objection. Why will this happen later? Why will people bow their knee later? If it is later, why later? Why later bow the knee? Why confess Jesus? Will they do it because they have come to believe in him as their personal savior? Is this evidence of a final, complete, universal repentance? No. No, the language here is not promising that every human being, including every demon and every devil, Satan himself, will finally become saved. It is not declaring that. You can't look at the rest of the scripture and defend that position. What it is declaring is that every person will acknowledge the lordship of Jesus Christ. It is declaring that every knee will bow. And if we look at the rest of Scripture, it becomes very clear. Some of those will bow willingly, and some will bow unwillingly. Some will confess in delightful worship, and some will confess in hateful submission. But all will confess and bow. The picture painted here is of an end times in which all of creation is assembled before the absolute ruler. And in that vast, countless flood and plain of individuals, there will not be found a single knee unbent. There will not be discovered a single silent tongue. When the command is given, every tongue will declare, Jesus Christ is Lord. For some, for a few, it will be a confession of affection and love. And for many, it will be a coerced confession of submission. Satan himself will be forced to declare Jesus Christ is Lord. Hitler, Pol Pot, Caesar Augustus, Nero, Caligula, they will be forced to declare Jesus Christ is Lord. Every serial killer, every brutal tyrant, every pagan, every lustful man or woman, every person who's defied Jesus, every atheist will be forced to declare Jesus Christ is Lord. And to physically represent their actual submission under his authority by bowing to him. Consider that day. The submission to Christ will be universal. Teens who laughed off morality during their teenage years and then died tragically in a car accident will face Jesus Christ and acknowledge through gritted teeth, he is Lord. Consider the stars of today who deny the authority of the Bible, who look to themselves as the, the arbiter of all things right and wrong, they will be forced to bow in utter humiliation and declare Jesus Christ is Lord. Think of a name. What's a famous name you know? Movie stars, athletes, Olympians, moguls of the media empires, politicians, rulers, tyrants, generals, Every single one will be there on that day, and they will be coerced by absolute divine power. Their knees will bend unwillingly. Their tongues will speak unwillingly. Jesus Christ is Lord. And there will be his people. Paul and Peter and David, Gideon, Moses, 
Stephen. Tyndale. Luther. And they will declare with joy, Jesus Christ is Lord. And they will bow gladly, affectionately, adoringly. The submission to Jesus Christ will be so comprehensive, so complete, so without exception, that it will be, as Paul says, to the glory of God the Father. The Trinity, according to Scripture, has this delightful determination to bring glory to one another. That's one of the things that I think we can miss when we might object that God is just concerned about his own glory. We forget that God is unlike us. He is triune. He exists in a multiplicity of persons, one being, three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And throughout the scriptures, all three persons are constantly determined to bring glory to the other. So the Father is commanding creation to bow to his Son And the Son is reflecting glory back to the Father as the planner of salvation. And the Spirit is determined to work throughout history so that the people that God wants as his own and claims as his own will be there on that day, having already bowed during their days. And so the Trinity will be exulting in the complete perfection of, of the accomplishment of their salvation plan. And all of heaven will resound with the justice of God's ultimate vindication that those who cursed and defied Jesus and did not repent will be forced to acknowledge their foolishness. Those who crave the glories of this earth and despise the glories of Jesus will see before all of creation the foolishness of that choice. Those who laughed at the existence of God will look at him and bow in terror before him. And his people will be giddy with joy. Because their treasure is the treasure. The Son will be shown to be the absolute supreme ruler and regent of creation. And the Father who orchestrated the plan will receive the glory. Of course, I can't say exactly how this is going, but I can almost imagine on that day with the the plane of endless humanity and being stretched before him, the son receiving the allegiance and acknowledgement of every being on that plane, turning and, and pointing to the father as the one who orchestrated it all and declaring, to you, father, be the glory of all that you gave me. I lost not one, and your enemies indeed are now bowing at my feet. Psalm 2 will take place Those who sought to defy God and who did not come in submission to the Son will be broken into pieces and his people who took refuge in him will be exalted with him into glory. Ladies and gentlemen, direct your attention to the exaltation of Jesus Christ. How do we do this? Let me give you some application. Give you four categories of application. What does this mean for us? What does it mean if we are rightly focused on the certain exaltation of Jesus Christ? What does it do for our life? I was thinking this week, if only there was a way that somehow the sermon and the message that we study on a Sunday, myself included, could, could be remembered on Monday when we wake up in the morning, that we could, be, we could be thinking about it. There could be some kind of mental trigger. Yes, yes, do that right now. Do that right now. And, and, and by Wednesday, when you're in the middle of your week, you could be thinking, yes, right, right now do that, what the Word said. May the Lord... Cause that to be accomplished. Let me give you four ways, practically, that we can begin to realize directing our attention to his exaltation. Number one, if this is true of us, if this is true of us, if we were thinking about his exaltation, his glory, 
we will think more often of him and less often of ourselves. I'm not speaking to pride and humility. I'll get to that in a minute. I'm just talking about the preoccupation that our minds often have with ourselves. That just quite quantitatively, we're thinking about ourselves a lot. Not that we're thinking a lot of ourselves. We're just thinking about ourselves a lot. We might be thinking thoughts about how terrible we are. But we're thinking about ourselves a lot. How do I feel today? How am I doing today? How, how, what am I not doing today? What does he think of me? What does she think of me? What do I think of me? What do the children think of me? Back to what do I think of me? What might she think of me? What might he think of me? What might I think of me after they tell me what they think of me? What can I think about me? Don't we often think that way? Oh, I've got a busy day. I've got a busier day than them. I've got less busier day than he does but I'm busier than he is. I'm suffering more than she is, but less than she is. More godly than him, less than her. I think she likes me more than him. I think she likes me less than her. I think he likes me sometimes and not other times. I think we think about ourselves a lot. Ooh, I was funny in that moment. Oh, that was stupid. Why did I say that? We, we (laughs) We think about ourselves a lot don't we? Can't believe they did that to me. So wrong. So wrong. It's so wrong, right? Don't you think it's wrong, what they did to me? I think it's wrong. Let's think about it some more, shall we? (laughs) Whether it's wilderness, self-congratulation, fantasies of exaltation, it goes back to when you're eight years old and you're out in the driveway, five, four, three, two, one. The victor. And you're 48, and you're still doing the same thing, except this time it's with the Salesman of the Year Award. (laughs) How many likes? How many reposts? How many loves online? We think about ourselves a lot. I think the Father would say, I've got something better for us to think about the exaltation of Jesus Christ. You know the greatest thing on that day? You will not be thinking about yourself. You'll be thinking about him. We need to think less of ourselves. And trust me, we can think about ourselves in proud ways and in self-pitying ways where we are still the center. This is not a only for the arrogant word. This is for the person who spends a week bemoaning what an awful sinner they are and spends a fraction of that time just thinking about Jesus. This is for the busy, idle of work person and the sloth. This is for the arguer and the silent passive one. This is for everybody. What goes on between our ears should be spent a lot more on Jesus. If we're focused on the exaltation of Jesus, we will think more often of him and less often of ourselves. Second application. We will think more of humility and less of pride. This passage begins with a call to the church to exercise humility, and then Paul loses himself in reminding them that their salvation and the all of history is going to culminate in a celebration of the humility of God the Son. But we shouldn't lose sight that the passage begins calling us to have this mind in yourselves and I think the not-so-subtle implication that in the end it is the humble who will be exalted and the proud who will be demoted. There is something of a motivation here too. Not that our humility is going to be saving or ultimate like Jesus, but since we believe in Jesus... There should be a desire to be humble in conformity to him. We should think a lot more of humility and a lot less of pride. In light of this passage, doesn't pride seem dreadfully terrifying? Doesn't humility seem delightful? 
Even in the smallest way, if we can reflect in our lives the reality of our union with this humble Savior. Listen, our God, I think according to this passage, we can say this on God's authority. Our God is humble. He is not grasping even of his rights. Does he receive worship? Yes, it would be proud not to receive worship. Because we are not God, we should not want to receive worship. We should want to worship him. We should think a lot more of humility and a lot less of pride. We should hate pride when it comes out in the conflict with our spouse, towards our children, towards that person who cut me off on the highway, towards my boss, towards my next-door neighbor when I was a kid who never appreciated what a great person I was. We should think a lot more of humility and a lot less of pride. We should be like God the Father and celebrate humility in the smallest reflection of it wherever we see it. We should not be like the arrogant, bragging boasters of this age who love talking about their accomplishments rather than about the accomplishments of others and ultimately the accomplishment of Christ. We should think a lot more of humility and a lot less of pride. We should want to be humble in light of this picture of our Savior in Philippians 2. Number three, we will embrace submission and tremble at defiance. We will embrace submission and tremble at defiance. Of all the doctrines of the faith, perhaps submission to Christ is most unpopular. The lordship of Christ over our lives is a fact declared and determined by God himself. There is no vote for lordship. It is a fact. This means that our submission to him, our obedience, is essential to our identity as Christians. To be a Christian is to be one who has bowed their knee and their heart to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon said, I cannot conceive it possible for anyone truly to receive Christ as Savior and yet not to receive him as Lord. One of the first instincts of a redeemed soul is to fall at the feet of the Savior and gratefully and adoringly to cry, Blessed Master, bought with thy precious blood, I own that I am thine, thine only, thine holy, thine forever, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? There are no inalienable rights, ultimately, except the right to obey Jesus. There are no (laughs) deservings except wrath. There are no ultimate callings that are not the calling to obey and adore Jesus Christ. So whether we obey him when we're working in our yard or when we're caring for our children or when we're waiting patiently for a marriage that hasn't come yet or whether we're obeying him in guarding our speech or guarding our eyes, whether we're obeying him in guarding our tongues or guarding our typewriter, we are obeying him because that is who we are as Christians. And this passage should cause us to tremble at defiance. Listen, if if you're here and you're postponing bowing to Jesus, please do not. You will bow to him. And when that day comes, there will be no more chance to bow willingly. There will only be bowing unwillingly. He's a delightful master. You cannot do better. You are currently doing worse if you're not bowing to him. Charles Virgin said, he will reign over you, either by your consent or without it. Finally, we will define today by the final day. We'll define today by the final day. That means that the most important thing for you tomorrow morning is that day when the plane of humanity bows in submission to Jesus. 
That means that the most important thing on your calendar still to happen is that day when the Lord Jesus returns. That means that if tomorrow or this week you are suffering or you are tempted, you can keep your eyes on that day and it will make all the difference on this day. It will make all the difference when you are suffering or when you are struggling or when your car is totaled or your washing machine has something inside clanking it again or when there is some problem relationally or when there is some difficulty with your parents' health or with your health or with your child's health. You can say that day. That day is coming. The exaltation of Christ will make us think more often about that day and define this day in light of that day. It means when we go to work this week, we will treat our boss in light of that day. We will think about honesty in light of that day. We will do mundane things that are obscure and serving but unseen in light of that day day. We will not calculate worth or value as the world does in terms of resources or human fame or knowledge or likes on Facebook. We will calculate it in terms of that day. We will think in terms of that day and we will treat one another and view ourselves in the light of the incredible mercy that if we have believed in Jesus, we can do now what all will do then. We can do now what all will have to do then. We can confess now what they will be forced to confess then exclusively by the grace of God and the humble salvation culminating in the cross of Jesus Christ. We can go to the crucified and risen one and say now, you are Lord. And I gladly and willingly and affectionately in this moment and this week and this month and this decision and this relationship and this conflict and this suffering, I declare I belong to you. That's what happens when we direct our gaze to the exaltation of Jesus Christ.